Welcome to uh, this event, Tower Saragusa Shva 2021. And now I give the floor to Professor uh, Gianpaolo Schillaci, who is the organizer of the, of the conference this time and next year. Gianpaolo, the floor is yours. Okay, we are going to start. Dear colleagues, dear friends, on behalf of all the members of the organizing committee, welcome to Toward Ragusa SHWA 2021. I feel a great emotion to open this fifth edition of Ragusa Safety, Health and Welfare in Agriculture and Agri Food Systems, or Ragusa Shva, as the fun of this international conference are used to pronounce. Today, all we should have been in the core of the wonderful Baroque city of Ragusa Ibla, a city in the middle of the South Sicily, Italy, enjoying the mutual empathy that each edition of Ragusa SHWA have always brought to us. Instead, due to a tiny microorganism, we are obliged to see each other in a telematic way. After all, it is not by chance that some presentation of this meeting talk about COVID. Let me to a brief history of the conference. The first edition was held in 2008 and there was a precious idea of a great colleague, Professor Pietro Piccarolo, University of Turin, Italia. Concluded the first conference, a few colleagues asked to the organizer, when the next? <laughs> By this way, between the joke and the challenge, gone the exciting adventure of the father edition of Ragusa SHWA. An adventure made possible thanks to the close collaboration of the members of the agricultural mechanics section of the University of Catania. A name for all, Dottoressa Sabina Failla, who from the first edition deals with the scientific secretariat and thanks to an organizing committee made up of enthusiastic Italian and foreign colleagues. In 2010 and 2012, the conference was held again in Ragusa. The next edition was held in Lodi, next to Milan in 2015, in collaboration with Rural Health. I thank Professor Claudio Colostio for having accepted working together. All the editions were supported by CIGR and Italian Society of of agricultural engineering. I thank the past president of the society, Professor Danilo Monarca, Ciao Danilo, and the current president, Professor Giacomo Scarascia Munoz. Every live edition of Ragusa SHWA took place under the edges of the presidency of the Italian Republic. In the meanwhile, the conference increases in participation authors and papers, and the website of the conference shows. As concerns 2021, Ragusa, SHWA, and Springer have subscribed an agreement. I'm meant to publish a full paper in a special indexed issue after reviewing. By a previous agreement, CAB abstract publishes abstracts in the website, you can find also information of very interesting awards coming from Tutta Agricoltura, a firm in Ragusa working for, from uh, 40 years in the field of the agricultural mechanization. An award is reserved for young researchers that will attend the 2021 conference. Moreover, in home, there is also a link with a blog speaking about Southeast Sicily. That will be, we hope, the destination for your next September attending, attending Ragusa SHWA 2021. During this uh, digital meeting, 
we will have the privilege to meet some SHWA veterans as John Rosgrans and Peter Landquist and other illustrious researchers as Celsino Govoni, Annick Starren and Martina Jacob, Giuseppe Santucci, and last but not least, Gioia Gibelli. I'm, in go I'm going to conclude this prelusion, deeply thanking all them and remembering that Ragusa SHWA loves contamination, collaboration, and sharing dream and doubts that it is up to us to convert in researchers and solutions able to improve life for people and environment. Now, I am very glad and proud to start the first edition of Ragusa SHWA, asking colleague Professor Remigio Berruto, incoming president of CIGR, co-organizer and moderator of Two Words Ragusa 2021, to introduce our illustrious speakers and their presentations. Remigio, go. Uh, thank you, Professor Schillaci. Welcome everybody here. So um, just a practical hints. Uh, so if you have a question for the presenter, place uh, the question in the chat and I will bring uh, them the question after they're speaking, okay? Uh, so welcome everybody here and uh, let's start uh, almost in perfect time uh, the program. So the first speaker is uh, Professor John Rosecrans from Colorado State University. He will speak about field research in the time of COVID-19. Uh, he is professor of occupational ergonomics at Colorado State University and received a PhD from the University of Iowa in biomedical engineering. Uh, he has a, a lot of experience in quantifying human exposure to physical risk associated to you know work, to physical work, and, uh, and look at different sectors, not only agriculture. And he work also closely with some of our colleagues from the University of Milan and University of Sassari. John, the floor is yours. Grazie, Remigio. Uh, buon pomeriggio a tutti. È un piacere uh, parlare con tutti voi oggi. Uh, a special thank you to John Paolo. Uh, John Paolo, as, as you know, uh, I, my first Ragusa was in 2010. And uh, it changed uh, my life in, in many ways, uh, as you know. Um, this is an interesting uh, conversation here uh, that I'm going to talk about in terms of occupational health research in agriculture during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's interesting because when I first talked to uh, uh, Giampaolo and uh, Remigio uh, about uh, a possible presentation, I had no idea uh, at that time in the springtime uh, what I'd be presenting in the fall. And of course, uh, as you know, COVID-19 has evolved and uh, is ever changing. I work at uh, the Colorado State University and we have a uh, Intermountain Center for Agricultural Health and Safety. We've had this center for oh, nearly 25 years and I've been part of it for the last 20 years. So I wanna talk about my experience over the last six months regarding uh, this pandemic and research. In the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly all major university research centers across the United States have stopped or halted in-person functions. That is, except for work on the pandemic. And rightly so, as we all know, this is a dangerous public health emergency that requires large scale shifts in how we live and work, but also requires a national response that is a national response from our countries uh, that matches the scale of the problem. Unfortunately, in the United States, the Trump administration has not had a national response that matches the challenges that we're faced with in this pandemic. In fact, Trump didn't just fail to address COVID-19, he actually made the crisis worse. Why else would we see headlines like this in the United States? 
the U.S. only has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of all, all COVID-19 cases. Now, there are several factors that explain this, but the primary one is the lack of a national effort to address this pandemic. The lack of a national plan affects nearly every university in the United States, and this includes our teaching, our service responsibilities to the community, as well as our research. In the absence of any national strategy for tackling coronavirus pandemic, uh, colleges and universities in the United States are on their own when it comes to deciding whether and how to bring students back to school and begin uh, with research again. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the challenges that we currently face uh, conducting occupational health research in agriculture during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if we take a more macro level perspective, we see that Italy was the first large country outside of China that started seeing a rapid growth in daily cases of COVID-19. That was in February. Uh, other, use, other EU countries soon followed. Italy hit their peak in March when the US was just seeing their first known cases. The cases then peaked in the United States uh, during our summer months. Let me briefly explain how this affected our research projects in agriculture. My doctoral student and I planned to be in Sardinia to collect data on low back biomechanics among fruit and vegetable pickers. We were collaborating with Maria Caria from the University of Sassari on this project by measuring low back kinematics among 100 pickers in central Sardinia. We had already completed a pilot study and planned to collect data in April and May. Unfortunately, that was one of the worst periods during the pandemic in Italy. As the cases decreased in Sardinia, we were hoping to collect data in uh, later in our summer. Then the US COVID cases exploded and Americans were not allowed to travel to Italy. This of course resulted in my doctoral student changing dissertation topics and delaying her graduation by one year. According to a survey, or actually several surveys of graduate students from Rutgers University, two thirds of PhD students report research delays due to the pandemic. Most of these students will be delayed at least one year to complete their dissertations. In my university, nearly every research lab has been closed with the exception of those working directly on COVID-19. In fact, our president and uh, provost um, has, per, uh, has um, uh, not let us do any non-essential research, only those that directly affect um, or involve COVID-19. Only now are some of us beginning to get back to research, however, um, our, our research in agricultural sector has changed dramatically, as you can imagine. We have put aside our past research and now focused on assisting agricultural producers with COVID-19 issues and assisting them with online education of their workers. But even as we began this academic year, just most recently, we are seeing the results of students back on campus hoping that we would have in-person classes. Many universities now in the US have had to scale back and put most of their classes online. Additionally, universities such as my university, Colorado State University, uh, routinely test all students that live on campus for COVID-19. Studies regarding stress on graduate students due to the pandemic are just coming out now and they indicate a significant increase in mental illness or mental health disorders. These recent studies indicate that depression has doubled among graduate students and anxiety has risen 50% during COVID-19. As most of my colleagues in academia uh, that I'm speaking with understand, we are only as good as our graduate students. Thus, psychosocial or psychological support is especially needed in the current pandemic climate. I believe that it's important for all of us to meet with students at least once per week during this period of relative social isolation. 
Graduate students are just one side of the equation to successful agricultural research. Of course, agricultural producers and workers are just as important. Currently in the United States, it's nearly impossible to go on farms, ranches, or dairies to collect data on workers. Even if researchers and workers were wore masks and face shields during data collection, owners of the farms and some dairies are not interested in being involved in research during this pandemic. Some owners have expressed uh, to us that they don't want anyone but workers on farms fearing that we will bring COVID-19 to the workers. Others are too busy developing safety procedures for COVID-19 and no longer interested in our type of research, even if it leads to greater productivity. Some farmers in rural America take a more political stance and say that COVID-19 is a hoax and similar uh, to the annual flu, which is, of course is absurd. With data like this, it's difficult to call this pandemic a hoax. This is a chart of the daily new cases of confirmed COVID-19 for Italy at the bottom down here, uh, the European Union, as well as the United States. So you can see, especially in the United States, we're still in uh, the throes of this pandemic. In the US, in fact, we've had nearly, well, it's 195,000 cases uh, as of today, but nearly 200,000 uh, deaths, I should say, as of today uh, due to COVID-19. And interestingly, that number is projected to increase uh, actually more than double if we stay on the same path we're taking right here more than double to 400,000 by the end of this year. So we still have a long ways to go. During this pandemic, the contributions of farm workers are more critical than ever. Unfortunately, in the United States, farm workers cannot shelter at home to remain safe from COVID-19. Instead, they must go to work. They are considered in the United States essential workers to ensure the nation's food supply uh, is maintained. Farm workers are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 because of the high rates of existing respiratory disease be, uh, from an occupational hazard. Uh, and, uh, additionally, they have very low rates of health insurance coverage and often substandard living and working conditions. Despite these risk factors, agricultural workers, that is the majority who are immigrants, lack many of the legal protections enjoyed by most other workers. This endangers um, them as well as their families uh, in terms of their health and well-being. If farm workers do get sick, most do not have access to paid leave to take time away from work, and they don't have medical care, and they face enormous barriers to receiving testing and the care that's needed to recover from uh, the COVID-19 and to keep it out of their communities. Unfortunately, though, the federal government, our federal government, has not established any enforceable rules either to protect farm workers from the coronavirus or to instruct employers what to do when their workers get sick. In many farming communities, farm workers represent a relatively small uh, percentage of the population, but a very large percentage of the cases that they're seeing. All of our agriculture research now is focused on COVID-19 issues. One of our uh, newest projects at our Ag Center is to provide dairy owners and managers, as well as workers, with the latest scientifically sound COVID-19 information. Another project uh, that our center just started is focusing on suicide prevention uh, due to the stresses associated with COVID-19, as well as other issues uh, that farmers are faced with living in uh, rural parts of America. So what have we learned in the last six months? Well, we know that there are significant limitations to what we used to do, our hands-on in-person research in agricultural health and safety. It may be several years before we return to the normal research or our normal research approaches. Additionally, there are rapidly Additionally, excuse me, there are rapidly changing and confusing non-scientific messaging about the pandemic being distrib distributed 
which inhibits our research efforts related to preventing COVID-19. Um, many people think, still think that the coronavirus only affects older people. That's why you see all these young people uh, having large parties. In the US at least, there is a significant amount of politics involved in the type of messaging to the public employers and to agricultural workers. This only further divides our country um, in terms of our fight against COVID-19. As mentioned in several uh, studies, there's a significant increase in mental health issues among our graduate students, business owners, and farm workers. Lastly, unfortunately, our immigrant farm workers, among them, there's a lack of culturally uh, appropriate materials available on COVID-19. And unfortunately, these are our most essential workers as well as the most vulnerable uh, to the devastating effects of COVID-19. Okay, well, grazie. And uh, I hope to see you all next year in person at uh, Schwa 2000, 2021 in Ragusa. Thank you, Professor Rosekans, very much for your uh, clear speech in time speech, you know. And uh, now is um, it's time for uh, for questions. Let's say let's see if um, okay, Gianpaolo say there is bias. There is enough reserves about people that work in uh, greenhouses or livestock are more probably affected in confront of the people that work in the field? Well, certainly those that are most affected are those that are closest uh, to each other. Um, when you have more workers closer, we see this in packing houses of fruit and vegetables. And uh, we see this in fisheries as well as our meat packing plants. Um, if, if you're working outside by yourself, sure, it's, uh, it's not nearly as, as dangerous but um, many of our workers are, are, are fairly close. And then they go back to communities because most of ours are immigrant. They go back to communities where they're living with three or four other families under one roof. Okay. Uh, so one question from, uh, from myself, um, do, you, do, do you see some solution for the university to start again a field work? Do you think there is possibility to start a field work with some procedure? To, not to stop too much, you know, PhD and research. What the... Well, I, I think it all depends upon uh, the rules of the university as well as uh, the degree of the pandemic. Uh, we are starting back other types of research where we're using survey data and uh, uh, data we've collected, you know, from several years ago. Uh, we, at our university, we are not allowed uh, to go out to a workplace and begin collecting data. I know it's different at other universities, but that's how it is at our university. Okay. There is a study about, you know, type of protection mask or something people can use. Uh, is ongoing study or? Uh, sure. You know, we have a lot of work at our university on COVID-19. Uh, many of my colleagues right now are working on uh, evaluating the effectiveness of different masks uh, to prevent um, the virus coming in or going out through the mask. And so we're doing work on masks. My student, I have another student working on three-dimensional anthropometrics of the face and looking at ways to uh, actually do 3D printing of masks. And so uh, we can get a better fit. And so we know that there's no air leakage. We're working with our other colleagues that are looking at materials in terms of, of the best ones to use. We are also looking at the design of masks in terms of uh, what seems to be culturally uh, more appropriate. Uh, for example, when, uh, when a man and woman go out to dinner in the evening, what kind of masks do you want it to look like? Should it match your outfit? So we're looking at these issues as, as well. Okay. Very interesting, okay. There are other questions from the audience. Uh, I think we, we are on, on schedule, so basically maybe in the discussion time, there will be still time for uh, eventually present uh, uh, your question. Um, yeah, another question is about uh, the, the atmosphere inside the tunnel is probably very dangerous. Tunnel, we mean uh, cold greenhouses. 
small cold greenhouses. Could we affirm that you know this uh, this atmosphere is quite uh, dangerous for the Absolutely. COVID? Anything Absolutely. inside where there's a, a limited airflow is going to be more dangerous. More dangerous. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John, very much. Now uh, let's let's um, go to the next speaker, which is um, Peter Lundquist. Lundquist. Okay. What about health and safety in Swedish agriculture in the time of COVID-19? A national report 2020. Uh, Peter Lundquist is a professor in world science at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. Uh, and he's a uh, look at injury prevention, ergonomics, and mental health in agriculture. He's also quite active in many different organizations, International Society of Agricultural Safety and Health, International Association of Rural Health and Medicine, and, and so on. He is also honorary president and advisor on agricultural science and technology at rural development in Korea. Okay, uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Okay. You can share your screen. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, having me on, on your uh, agenda here, the, on your scheme here as a, as a presenter. And uh, I as, um, say as John, I really look forward to uh, come and attend um, your uh, conference next year in, in uh, Ragusa. I, I have very good memories from previous events there, so I hope to come back. Uh, but it's still great to meet here uh, in this uh, way, uh, to keep up the, the pace and think about, discuss about these things here. And um, yes, I have a title here about what health and safety in Swedish agriculture in the time of COVID-19. A national report 2020. And first of all, I have to say that I don't have so much data and thing to say about the COVID as uh, John, but I'll add some some small things. But I'd also discuss about other aspects that we have of concern in our country and my personal views uh, right now. So yes, I come from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, and we are in the very the campus I work on is in the very south of Sweden, close to uh, Denmark, but we have activities in many other areas, places around the country as well as a national university for agriculture and related areas. And uh, there's an aerial photo of our campus and you see to the left is Malmo, the city of Malmo, and, and to the right across the water is Copenhagen and in between there is a bridge. So it's, it's close to Europe and uh, we have good connections with other uh, collaborations with Europe in different ways, but also, of course, with our parts of Sweden. Um, and what about COVID-19? Let me start to say that uh, our government, they, uh, they uh, take much advice on with, uh, from the public health agency of Sweden. They are the ones that really give us, and, and also the government, the guidelines for what to do about COVID-19. So uh, that have been the way of handling it. And, and the government is more like giving support to, to handle uh, the COVID uh, when it's needed with financial support and other type of things, decisions. But they lean on the public health agency of Sweden and so do all the rest of us in Sweden do. We, we follow the recommendations very well, I would say. Uh, and the initial problems in Sweden was that we were not prepared for pandemics at all. So we really didn't have any uh, uh, backup uh, with uh, personal protection uh, equipment or uh, other type of resources at all. And that was a really a disaster for uh, the healthcare system. And uh, that caused also that we had a lot of uh, fatalities uh, among the elderly population, uh, both in, in, in uh, the elderly uh, in the nursing homes and in home care. And also we had a lot of uh, problems within the healthcare systems from the beginning before we got the uh, right the resources and could have the protection needed and how to handle it. Uh, and, uh, but then um, as an opposite to many other countries, we have never had the recommendations to use uh, uh, masks in public in, in Sweden. We have uh, had um, the advice to wash hands keep the distance, stay home if you're sick, uh, any kind of in, uh, illness or any kind of whatever uh, things that could be in the flu or whatever, you stay at home. And, and also promoted 
people to work from home as much as possible and work at the distance in different ways. And our university have uh, had uh, mostly um, have had a distance education and most of us uh, work at home. But from this new term starting after the summer, uh, we have again students at our campus. So we had education for the one for the new new start new um, uh, new students that are starting up. They they go to campus, have classes with extra space and things like that. And but the other the other students, the older ones that have been in the system, they work mainly from home and on a distance. And also, I'd like to add that uh, Swedish schools uh, up to uh, the age of uh, 15, 16, they have been normally in schools all the time. So there have been not, no closure of uh, schools. And the older ones at high schools, they have studied on a distance. So the school system have been running quite well over this time. Uh, so when talking about agriculture, the main worries from the farmers in Sweden, we don't have the large um, uh, type of uh, agricultural companies like you have like in North America or in other parts of Europe. So we have more family farms and so on. So, the, and, But still we have farms that need seasonal workers coming from other countries. So the problems were in the beginning that they were so worried that they were not allowed to travel from other countries to Sweden, the, for the seasonal workers. So that was the big thing. But that worked out. So um, the farm workers arrived and they don't bring families. So it was uh, no really any problems uh, when it come to, uh, to uh, farm workers in, in, on the farms and so on. And uh, there is very little advice really when it comes to uh, farming farmers and the farm workers about how to handle COVID-19 compared to general, they all get, always talk about the general advice that should be implied both in private and on workplaces. So that is to keep the distance and wash your hands and whatever. So it's that type of uh, the things. And it also have made the consumers to be more aware of uh, you should buy locally produced through uh, fruits and uh, vegetables and whatever from agriculture to promote your own industry. That have been uh, a, a thing. About uh, looking into um, other countries like in our neighbor country, Denmark, across the bridge here, they have a, made a lot much more material. I wasn't able to download it in, with pictures and so on, but there is a link in my presentation about like um, there's an ID catalog with examples of solutions to prevent coronavirus in the workplace if you have um, the workers in different places and uh, seasonal workers. So they give with photos and good, uh, good examples with photos and so on, and, and also a text with uh, examples of how you can solve it and, and in a practical way on, in a workplace. So there is a link, uh, you can, you can uh, check it out if you have an interest in it. It's written in English as well. So it's quite a good material. But in Sweden, we have only the general recommendations when it comes to COVID-19. Instead, um, the, 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 there have been a presentation this summer or this autumn here about uh, web uh, education material have been developed and they tried to launch it uh, early spring, but it was just uh, started up the corona, so it wasn't very much to do about it. But uh, be before we have tried other type of education material and so on, but this is a new uh, education material and it's supposed to uh, uh, be su a good support for uh, on the web. So it's, it's good to uh, be using if any, it's adjusted to different type of um, uh, farming, it's, uh, and so they can be used with a different type of uh, checklists and also kind of links to uh, research, fact sheets and things like that. It's supposed to, to answer the more general questions and small problems that you could have on a, on a farm when you are working with health and safety or have an interest or a problem. And there are special material for both uh, da dairy and there is for uh, poultry, pigs, horses, and, and beef production, as well as crop growing there. So it's a quite a good, a good material. And when interesting, they have also produced uh, posters to put up on the, in, the, in the workplace, and you have stickers. You can put a sticker on a danger, danger on your farm that 
Hey, you have a PTO, please beware here, it's a dangerous PTO and so on. So it's uh, every day small things about to improve and, and to re give the farmers reminder, uh, farm workers about reminders about the dangy, daily dangers. And a good thing is also that they develop special material for uh, ag schools and, and for the support material for the teachers because they were really lacking mat good material. And they are also giving uh, examples on how to organize the practical, uh, uh, practical uh, things together with the students. Uh, you can do it outdoors or in a classroom or whatever to uh, discuss and dem demonstrate different types of situations. That's quite good. Uh, there has also been a development of uh, material since in Sweden we have uh, seasonal workers coming from many different countries uh, with different languages. It's not only like Spanish, it's, uh, we have all kinds of, it could be Russian or Polish or uh, uh, Lithuanian or whatever, whatever type of uh, language. So there is now uh, booklets with drawings without any words about showing very clearly about a risk situation and the right, right way of handling it or what you should avoid or how you should solve it. It's quite a good material that can be also downloaded and be used in other countries as well, I think, in other countries. So it's a good example of material uh, recently developed. Uh, a thing we have been working on right now, or working on, is rural crime. We see it as a, a major uh, um, uh, work environment issue because it affects the farmers and the farm family and farm workers quite much if you have problems with rural crime. And we have special focus on the uh, animal uh, producing farms uh, because you also have animal rights activists and, and things like that that are causing a lot of problems but also uh, worries and so on. So it, and um, so we, we are in the middle of uh, to um, closing down this study because uh, we made it as a mail study to uh, with using their emails addresses to all these uh, farmers having uh, animal production and we have very good help from all their own organizations so uh, we have uh, many th thousands of uh, answers to handle and and we will continue with uh, in-depth uh, interviews uh, also later on maybe we'll do it uh, on a distance, well, as if things not improve as it's now. That's one example of what we're doing. Another thing is quad bikes or, uh, or uh, ATVs is a big issue in Sweden as well. There has been developed a new strategy, a national strategy to uh, how to improve uh, the working conditions or the use of quad bikes uh, or uh, the ATVs and to uh, convince or to see how uh, the use of uh, rollover protections uh, can be uh, functioning in Swedish uh, nature or Swedish uh, farms or whatever. Uh, we have uh, started up a, a full-scale test, so we have imported 50 uh, of these uh, quad bars or, uh, from uh, Australia, and they are offered to uh, these farmers and others, professional users, uh, so they, they can... Uh, test them over a whole year and they only pay uh, uh, like a, a very small amount and they are then uh, they take part in our study we follow them over a whole year in how it functions if they have any incidents and, and uh, their experiences with them that. another thing we are working on is a rollover warning system with alarm that if you have uh, if you have walking where you have quite steep uh, terrain uh, you could give an alarm from from the machine that tells you that you better be careful because it's there is a risk of turning over uh, and if you don't listen to that and you have a rollover there will be a, an, a, a message sent to uh, to your uh, to your home or to your ex to your uh, uh, to your workplace or whatever you want it so you can get quick help so that's what we do there we have uh, been working very much to trying to raise money to re research on mental health because we see it's a, it's a very one of the major problems of uh, farming today is the mental health in different ways. It can be the 
the pressure of changing weather, if it's uh, the climate change or whatever, it causes a lot of problem. In 2018, we have serious drought in also in Sweden, and, and that caused a lot of uh, ringing a lot of bells for Swedish farmers. Then you have the normal financial stress in different ways. The rural stress have been shown to rural crime is a major factor. Of course, you have a lot of family issues nowadays because the structure of rural life is changing and, and so there is a lot of tensions there also on, on the family level. And then you have the problems with the authorities, regulation, the health of your animals or whatever it can be. So we see it, it's a major problem and we are really working hard to raise money to do research. And I would also hope that we can have more international collaboration when it comes to, to these issues. Um, and one other thing we have been doing is uh, they have been established a certification system so that you can uh, certify, be having a certified workplace that it fi uh, feels all the, it, uh, it's a guarantee that uh, the food that's being produced in that farm, it follows all the good requirements for uh, uh, good working conditions and also good housing system if you have provide housing for your workers, like um, the seasonal workers. So it's a quite a good system. And it's especially it's uh, developed uh, in uh, for uh, field grown crops where you have seasonal workers or salads or um, tomatoes in greenhouses and things like that. So it's an interesting approach to make the consumers more aware of uh, the working conditions. Uh, international collaboration is uh, essential, very essential, especially for a small country like us. Uh, we have been developed, uh, worked together with South Korea for three years uh, and worked, uh, have had an intensive collaboration and exchange program with them and we are helping them to build up and establish uh, a center for health and safety in agriculture. So that's, that's a promising development there, I would say. Uh, we have also lately, during this COVID area, uh, had a lot of connections with uh, uh, Jamber University in Indonesia. Uh, I didn't know about them before, but they are doing great thing when it comes to health and safety, uh, I would say. And especially now when it's uh, COVID-19, it's really interesting to take part in their seminars and so on. So this area of remote work and remote connections also opens up other uh, possibilities and connections that maybe you didn't f would find out otherwise. So uh, that's, that's quite interesting. But to starting end of my presentation here, I say the problem is that we have less, less resources for health and safety in agriculture. I see it in my country. Uh, I will retire in a few years and they will not uh, have a new professor in this area. It, it will be a, focus on uh, agricultural farm management instead. And uh, there will be no much uh, research in um, ag health and safety at our university anymore. So and we see that there are very few uh, researchers left in our country. And, and I also see it in other countries, we're getting few, few less and less people. And you see also there are less no, people with knowledge about health and safety in organizations or in authorities and so on. So I think, it's a, this is a really big concern, at least uh, what I see is in, in our country and other countries. Uh, but okay, there are other good examples. I think that's something we need to be aware of, think about the future. And in, in this, that context, uh, when you look at all these uh, organizations and networks we have on, on uh, occupational health and safety in, in agriculture, I think it's a, a little bit uh, confusing a little bit. You have the international section of ISSA, you have ISAS, you have, you have all these uh, formal organizations and we have these informal organizations and networks like uh, this uh, uh, Ragusa network and we have one in the Nordic, Nordic countries and so on. So there is a lot of these connections but uh, there are less and less people that involved in this area so I think it will be a problem in the future and we we speak with different voices. I think we should try maybe to collaborate even more between these organizations that have an interest in, in health and safety. So maybe a joint big conference to join all these organizations that have an interest in health and safety or in agriculture or do something else. I think we really need even more to work together to, uh, to be strong. Otherwise, 
these issues will be forgotten in the in the, the near future, in 10, 20 years, maybe there are very few left. And I, um, finally, I'd want to uh, give you also a welcome to a, a Nordic event that had been postponed this year and will be next year in, in Norway, a Nordic meeting on agricultural, occupational health and safety. And it's uh, just uh, uh, the weeks before uh, the Great Ragusa event. And I know that people coming from North America, Australia, or so have also uh, combined this uh, event before uh, to a study with uh, visiting the Nordic uh, 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 meeting and then going down to uh, attend the Sicily meeting. So it's a, another option if you want to go to Europe from other parts of the world. So thank you very much. Uh, so there are some questions for, uh, for, for Peter before going on with the next speaker. Sure. Okay, so the question, uh, so the question are, let's say, uh, okay, let's see the question is, okay, the, basically the, the material that you, that you mentioned in your presentation are material that include also some uh, hints about COVID-19? Yeah, I, 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 uh... I had a link in my presentation to the Danish material because I think they have a, uh, a very good example of good material and it's uh, been written in English as well. And, and if you go to that link, uh, you can also find more uh, material that can be of uh, interest as a good example. And, and especially I think that the Danish, uh, they have done quite a lot of good materials when it comes to uh, hand, giving advice to uh, the farming population about COVID-19. Okay. Uh, another question. Why <clears throat> could you explain why consumer in, uh, in Sweden are more oriented to local produce during the pandemic? Well, uh, yeah, no, uh, because, yeah, in, initially they, they uh, we were really worried about the, the, the farmers uh, that they also, because um, they didn't, were not able to uh, sell their products because of the restaurants were, had very few uh, uh, people coming to the restaurants and so on. So they couldn't deliver any, very little to the restaurants, but people stayed at home, uh, didn't go to restaurants. And then, uh, and also, uh, uh, so that was one thing and they, they couldn't, uh, uh, they had also problems to they had to throw away um, uh, food food in the beginning or products in the beginning because the seasonal workers were not there so they couldn't harvest enough things and so on so there were in the beginning there was a lot of um, worries about the farmers and, and their work and their products and so on and also they were not able to sell so uh, the products as I say so so it made the consumers to be more interesting to buy. Uh, local products, Swedish products, and also to to go to whenever they were war, war, dared to do it again. They went back to uh, local restaurants. So they, they said that we have to support our local restaurants so they can uh, the survive uh, during these tough times and home delivery of locally produced food and so on. So they were all different. But it was interesting to see that uh, it increased uh, the awareness and the interest for locally produced products. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Another question is uh, the certification system about the certified work uh, place. Is it is mandatory or voluntary? No, it's a, it's a voluntary, but there are uh, uh, especially one food chain uh, that wants to, that promotes it. They have been uh, asking for this uh, system and they, they also promote it. So farmers get more paid, better paid when they have this uh, certification. And um, we have this kind of, this certification, they have certification for many other aspects of farming, like uh, uh, hygiene aspects of food hygiene, or when it comes to climate adaption or whatever. So this is like another part of certification systems, but it's interesting because it has a special focus on working conditions. So you get a special certification on working conditions. So. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's, I haven't seen it so many other places really. It's one interesting approach, I think. Okay. Uh, so another another question from, from Gianpaolo is, do you think uh, 
we have a sufficient result or investigation uh, results about COVID-19 that could become a topic for Agus Rashfa 2021? Yeah, yeah, yes, I think so, yeah. Why not? Why not? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then uh, Jean Paul also say, you know, this kind of dilemma question say, we often use the climate change, uh, but this sort of neutral expression instead, since it's a human factor that, uh, you know, change the climate, should we change, find another expression to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, you can you can work, you can try to different way of coping with climate change. And um, during one of my visits to Korea, I went to a, a special institute for climate change in agriculture, and it was quite interesting because they made calculations on how it would affect uh, the individual farm uh, in in the future. And with diff whatever the best calculated, they make made updates of the calculations all the time, but the farmer could go in on this uh, web uh, page or this uh, com where computer model, whatever, and, and see that in, in uh, this, in 20 years time, I will not be able to, to grow apples anymore. So maybe I will change to grow mangoes or whatever in the future. So they were preparing for that the climate change also will affect the working conditions and and also what type of crops or production you could have in a changed climate. So it was another way of doing it. It's a way of, uh, of course, you want to stop the climate change, but maybe you can't, and then you have to be prepared and, and work with it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there are not, uh, let's see, there are other messages. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I think we are we are all set uh, basically for your question for the moment. Uh, thank you very much. Let's clap our hand also for uh, for Peter. At least the people have the video on. So um, and then now now I um, I give the floor to Professor Danilo Monarca who will present the next speaker. Thank you, Professor Remigio Berruto, dear colleagues, and pleased to introduce uh, Professor Celsino Govoni, one of the leading Italian and European experts in the chemical risk assessment sector. The, this sector is a, another very topical one uh, because the use of uh, chemicals in agriculture represents a risk factor for both the consumer and the workers involved. Uh, only a few words about uh, Celsino national expert in the field of health protection, Italian scientific expert of the Forum in the European Ch Chemical Agency, uh, representative of regions and autonomous provinces in the National Coordination Technical Committee, and uh, representative of the regions and uh, autonomous provinces uh, uh, at the National Technical Scientific Council. But uh, all we know, because uh, uh, Scienzino is also one of the organizers of the REACH, or REAC, the Conference on uh, Chemical Risk, which brings together the main experts in the sector every year, uh, based alternatively one year in Bologna and uh, the other one in Modena. Dear Scienzino, thank you for doing us the honor thank of you. accepting uh, our invitation. I leave you the word and I wish good afternoon to you and to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alo, and um, good day uh, to everyone. Uh, um, the chemical products mostly used in agriculture belong to the category of plant protection uh, products, biocides, fertilizers, detergents, lubrication, uh, and oils, and tools in because the, the social legislation on health and, and safety in uh, the workplace is uh, strongly influenced by the product legisl legislation. In, in fact, uh, we can emphasize a clear differentiation uh, between the concept of chemical risk, either for health or for safety in agricultural work. Uh, overview. Um, this uh, presentation uh, will focus on the three topics uh, the, um, that need to be considered 
when the workers are expo exposed to chemicals uh, uh, in agriculture, uh, agriculture as a workplace. Um, occupational chemical risk, chemical risk assessment, and safe use of chemicals in agriculture. Um, now let, uh, let's uh, talk about the occupational chemical risk in uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, war um, downstream user in agriculture. Um, downstream users um, generally are farms or employers using uh, chemicals and or uh, cancerous and mutagen agents during their uh, professional uh, activities. Uh, according uh, to uh, European chemicals legislation, um, the farmer is a, a downstream user. Um, are uh, carcinogen and mutagen agents used, used in agriculture uh, normally? Uh, these agents aren't used in the agricultural sector, except when a gasoline uh, is used as fuel or in other rare cases. Um, so, um, how to identify and uh, downstream use in agriculture um, and, uh, and the downstream user uh, is a, a farmer. Those uh, who uh, use substances or mixtures without providing them in the downstream supply chain. So, um, um, in other words, uh, the farmers use the chemicals or own uses without selling uh, uh, or uh, transferring the products or um, to uh, other farmers. Uh, matter of, of fact, the farmers must use chemical products in his uh, work activities uh, according to the health and safety and environmental protection indications prescribed in the safety data sheet, SDS, that uh, are uh, com compulsorily uh, provided um, to him. Um, uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, safety data sheet uh, represents the highest level of our information on health and safety in the workplace. Other information contained in uh, the different section of uh, SDS are useful uh, for adopting protect, um, protective measures for environmental protection. Um, the, um, the chemical uh, products most, uh, mostly used uh, actually uh, is a uh, um, um, plant protection products, but, uh, but uh, in, um, in time of uh, COVID-19, uh, biocides and detergents uh, uh, also in, uh, in, uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, the relation between uh, uh, SDS in agriculture and the chemical risk assessment under chemical agents uh, regarding uh, dangerous uh, chemical agents dangerous chemical agents under occupational safety and health uh, legislation uh, are dangerous substances uh, um, as such or dangerous mixtures uh, in poor case, uh, transport, storage, uh, or working processes, uh, mixing treatments uh, uses uh, uh, Z-release dangerous uh, substances in, uh, in workplace. Uh, now, um, uh, now uh, let's uh, talk ab about uh, chemical risk assessment. Um, another important information uh, is that uh, the documentation and information uh, contained in a uh, safety data sheet uh, are uh, essential for the farmer because they will allow to him to apply the risk management measures in uh, agriculture. Um, health. 
as uh, uh, primary it's important uh, it's important to assess the chemical risk to um, to work itself uh, to avoid uh, occupational diseases the chemical risk uh, for health is usually connected with the medium and long term toxicology toxicology properties of uh, chemical substances the risk uh, to health uh, produce stochastically uh, professional diseases secondly uh, secondly to uh, assess the uh, to assess the chemical risk uh, we have uh, to consider the risks uh, for uh, the safety of workers uh, also uh, the ir- risks uh, to uh, safety produce stochastically uh, injurious um, in agriculture uh, it's uh, equally important to assess the chemical risk for the safety uh, of workers to avoid injuries and uh, um, in- intoxications the chemical uh, um, risk uh, for safety is usually connected uh, with the chemical uh, physical or chemical reactive uh, and toxicological uh, um, properties uh, with a short uh, um, short terms uh, short term effect um uh, uh, the, the priority of obligations of uh, the uh, downstream users uh, regarding the use of dangerous chemical um, agents um, in uh, uh, in uh, in primary uh, the necessity an obligation uh, flowing from the chemical risk um, assessment uh, uh, for employers uh, is to define the slide risk or, or to the health or, 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 or safety um, and safety and uh, in specific obligation to the employer farmer in uh, the specific obligation to um, to farm with uh, with the um, employees uh, are those to carry out uh, the specific obligations for downstream users um the the, the, the threshold uh, uh, um, upper uh, the slightly chemical risk to the health and safety of workers um uh, connected uh, a specific uh, um specific uh, uh, um, obligation for uh, for farmer for uh, for uh, for employers for um for downstream user uh, 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 the primary uh, the uh, primary uh, obligation Uh, in this uh, scenario uh, is a replacement of chemicals that are dangerous to the health and safety of the farmer with others uh, uh, that are less or so or that are aren't dangerous um, and uh, uh, the general obligation of the employer and specific obligation above um, the threshold uh, of irrelevant risk for health and low for safety um, the chemical uh, uh, risk assessment in agriculture um, in in case of uh, chemical uh, chemicals are only uh, with only eco uh, eco toxicologically Uh, properties aren't considered in risk assessment for protection uh, the health and the safety in uh, of the farmer in a uh, uh, workplace uh, uh, now uh, let's talk about the safe use of chemicals in agriculture
um, what are the mandatory prevention and protection measures uh, for the professional user? General principles of hygiene and prevention, use of work equipment and personal, uh, protection, uh, protective uh, equipment, a chemical protection uh, in uh, uh, third position. Uh, uh, choice and, uh, and use of, of appropriate collective and individual pro prevention and protection measures, in other words, uh, are risk management measures for the uh, farmer. Uh, the minimum obligation for the employer, uh, but also for the member of the family business, um, self-employed uh, uh, workers, uh, or uh, direct farmers for uh, on the agricultural fund, or um, the, the, co the simple companies operating in the agriculture sector uh, are uh, are use safe work equipment. Mm. The uh, criteria uh, uh, for uh, the correct choice. Uh, choice uh, of uh, um, equipment, uh, um, general and, uh, and, and specific in agriculture is uh, uh, in this condition. Uh, but uh, um, in, uh, in, um, in connected, uh, connected for uh, um, personal um, protective equipment, uh, the, uh, the farmers, uh, the uh, worker, uh, uh, wear um, PPE and uh, use them in accordance with the provisions or the low and the good agricultural and hygiene techniques. In the presence of chemical risk and in case of accidents and emergencies, training for use of PPE is mandatory. Um, the uh, criteria for uh, the correct choice of uh, PPA must go through um, these levels uh, of uh, insight and evaluation and, and finally choose the best and uh, most efficient uh, uh, personal protective equipment uh, on, on the market. Uh, the employer uh, must uh, uh, inside a specific training for for their uh, for their workers. Uh, training is also a relevant obligation for the members of the family farms, self-employed workers, direct farmers uh, of the own property fund, the members of simple companies operating in the agricultural sector or their very small agricultural companies. So uh, the um, theoretical uh, and uh, practi practical, uh, practical training, training with certificate of attendance uh, to be repeated annually if use is uh, infrequent, must uh, be performed by a competent trainer. Uh, who in uh, turn has received a specific training and follows a specific update, uh, regular intervals in relation to the specific uh, uh, respiratory um, protection equipment, uh, respiratory uh, protective uh, equipment. And in, in any case, never exceeding uh, five years. Uh, so as criteria um, uh, in base of uh, chemical risks uh, present in uh, workplace, uh, connected assessment to task uh, and work risks, identification of uh, as the exposed parts of the body, uh, identification of the types of necessary uh, personal protective equipment, identification of the characteristics of uh, the individual uh, um, PPE, a search of for PPE available 
on the market uh, in in funds uh, choice choice uh, of uh, uh, personal pre protective equi equip equipment um, uh, but uh, uh, reading uh, and uh, rigorously apply uh, the risk management uh, measures uh, for reason uh, in the SDS in the safety data sheet can uh, provide greater health and safety uh, for workers. Um, uh, however, in case of intoxication, it uh, offers uh, uh, important information for first uh, aid management uh, and for hospital uh, staff uh, who um, intervene for uh, transport to the hospital or for the administration for the antidotes and for hospital treatment. Uh, the uh, safety data sheet uh, also provides essential information in case uh, of fire, accidental release, handling, uh, storage, uh, transport, and also in waste management. Um, for the safe use of chemicals, uh, uh, is, uh, it's uh, uh, necessary to know the hazardous uh, uh, properties of chemicals uh, the characteristics of chemicals, uh, know the method and procedures for use and uh, uh, risk uh, management measures. All this uh, is possible if the uh, SDS and the exposure scenario uh, consecutively uh, of the use of chemicals uh, are carefully uh, applied. Um, uh, thanks uh, for, for attention. I hope that, uh, that this reflection will serve to everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Govoni, for this uh, interesting presentation. I have a question that I didn't put, put in the chat, uh, but uh, you know, it's also uh, this uh, training material, no? The, the norms specify this type of training. There are uh, official training material available through videos or, you know, remote that uh, worker can use or downstream user can use to, to, to make the training. I mean, video or online material available for users. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yes, the, the, the materials, uh, bibliographic, is uh, possible uh, uh, obtained, uh, but uh, uh, in uh, in um, in Italian um, language uh, uh, certainly, but uh, in uh, English languages uh, um, is possible uh, to have the uh, documentation uh, at uh, European. Uh, a chemical agency, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, OSHA, uh, the uh, um, Occupational and Safety and Health Agency of Bilbao, is possible to, to have the um, documentation useful in, a, in, in agriculture, uh, connecting the uh, problematic for, for farmer, for topics uh, uh, present in the, um, is possible to, 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 to waive. Okay. Uh, well, uh, some more question. Uh, for example, uh, one question say, okay, 2030 European New Green Deal target include the reduction of 50% of pesticide use. Reduction of pesticide use by 50%. In your opinion, which will be the most effective strategy to reduce the use of pesticides? Um, the use of uh, uh, plant protection uh, products is uh, very uh, important for uh, reduce uh, the chemical risk uh, in agriculture. The chemical risk uh, deriving from 
from uh, the use of chemical products in agriculture concern all chemical uh, substances, uh, both uh, alone and uh, in mixture. Uh, for example, in uh, mixing uh, of phytosanitary products, uh, in, uh, in direct use of any chemical product, uh, such as uh, synthetic uh, products or natural uh, origin, uh, which can um, develop danger, dangerous substances in form of, uh, of gas, uh, vapors, mist, and dust, uh, uh, and, uh, and as uh, waste. The uh, plant production products are the products uh, the most important to know the chemical uh, risk assessment in agriculture for quantity, for numbers, uh, products, uh, but uh, uh, also actually uh, the, the biocides and the fertilizers uh, in agriculture are important for um, uh, evaluation and uh, uh, risk assessment in, uh, in agriculture. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gorboni. Um, Okay, now I give the floor to Professor Monarca. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Shelsino, for your nice presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, mm, Remigio, please, go on. <laughs> okay, now, now is uh, discussion time. So if there is still a question to the three presenters, the three main speakers, we are here to, to, to eventually... Uh, and reply, reply to, you know, to post questions to them and they can still reply. So I have a, I have a question for, uh, for Celsino. During this year of, uh, of training and, you know, norms about use of, of chemical reduction, how much the accident uh, were reduced over time? It's, a, <laughs> it's very difficult to... Uh, to tell uh, uh, the basis uh, uh, or the same cultural and professional preparation of uh, every farmer on the chemical risks uh, is uh, very difficult to consider. The statistics uh, uh, of uh, incident uh, of, of injuries in, 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 in Europe uh, uh, by uh, the um, uh, Occupation Safety and Health uh, Agency for uh, this problem. In Italy, um, the, the information uh, for these uh, um, topics uh, um, is, is a very variable uh, year, uh, year to year. Um, the problem uh, is not... Uh, um, uh, evaluate uh, uh, with uh, the uh, training and uh, evaluation in, in this case. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, one question still uh, from uh, from Marcello from Crea. Do you think that to, to Peter and John, do you think that COVID-19 has increased the social disadvantages of immigrant or seasonal worker compared to regular workers? Who want to reply? Well, I can okay, sorry. Both. Let's say both. Both reply because you represent different situation, basically. Okay. So go ahead, Peter. And then okay. John. Okay. I just say that uh, I have asked uh, representatives of both the employers' organization and, and the farm workers' organization, and they say it has been running very smoothly. So in Sweden, we have not have very few incidents uh, involving uh, seasonal workers and and, uh, and uh, it seems like they are coping quite well with this. Uh, so it's uh, it's not a ma any major problem at all. Okay, and for John, for the USA? Uh, certainly in the United States, uh, COVID-19 has affected a, a disproportionate uh, number uh, of immigrant and seasonal farm workers than other parts of the population. So absolutely in the United States, um, without a doubt. Okay. 
Uh, okay, now still a question from uh, Professor Febo. Thank you, Remigio. Uh, yes, I have a question for Peter. Uh, is there a, a reason? It's quite a general question. Is there a reason for which you don't use and you don't talk of using masks in Sweden? Well, uh, I'm not not expert, but the experts on, and uh, our authority for um, health issues, they say that uh, there are so many other issues, problems with using masks because people, they don't handle the masks uh, even a proper way. So if you have, if you're going to use a mask, it has to be in a very focused situation, like uh, when you have to very focused work in like in a health issue, health uh, in a hospital or something like that, or in uh, taking care of elderly, or when you're maybe sitting on an airplane to travel from one distance to another during one hour, you, or in a very crowded area where you sit focused and you don't touch your uh, mask and so on, because they say if you use running around with masks, uh, they, in the studies they have referred to, they, they are not functioning very well and people are in a negative way they are they believe they are safe and about they and then they are taking risky behaviors going too close to other people and so on so they they say that uh, they don't recommend us to do it and people you in sweden you only see very few people uh, out in shops and so on with masks on you sometimes you see uh, elderly people um, that didn't dare to go out before they have they come out and, and use uh, masks sometimes and you see also uh, people from Asian countries, they use masks sometimes, but it's very, very few people using masks in Sweden. And uh, well, it's, it doesn't seem to uh, increase the spreading of uh, COVID-19 in, in Sweden. Okay, thank you. Okay, it seems there are no questions for, the, for these uh, three main speakers. So basically we will have a break, uh, let's say until uh, five o'clock. It's a kind of a coffee break, whatever, and, uh, and see you at five o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to inform you that the fifth edition of the International Conference Regusa SHWA will be held in September 2020. The conference deal with the topics connected with safety, health and welfare in agriculture and agro-systems. Brigasuibla is the venue of the conference. Case of wonderful Baroque architecture Brigasuibla is sited in the southern Sicily, the greatest island of the Mediterranean Sea. Brigasa SHWA started from 2008 and all the editions were held under the auspices of Italian Republic President. In the occurrence of Expo 2015, the fourth edition was held in the lovely town of Lodi, close to Milan, together with the International Congress on Rural Health. The two international conferences adopted the Lodi Declaration on Rural Health. Regusa SHWE is a conference which allow for close interaction with attendees. English is the official language. As concerns topics, since 2012 the presentations about WMSDs and urban safety are dramatically increased. As concerns the previous editions, SHWA provided each participant a book of abstracts and a CD containing all the papers presented. The papers were also published in the conference website. Please, follow Rigasa SHWA on website www.rigasashwa.it, on Facebook and Twitter and let us have your any suggestion to innovate SHWA and make it more attractive for you. Remember that in September the weather in Sicily is not hot and the sea is still splendid. All we'll be very happy to invite you to cut with us the final cake of the 5th edition of the International Conference Brigasa SHWA 2020.
Okay, now now we have the second uh, the second part of the of the communication. Okay, I give the floor to to Giuseppe Santucci. Uh, he's associate professor at the Department of Computer Science, La Sapienza in Rome, and uh, he will speak about leveraging on end users to reduce cybersecurity risks. On these topics, he has published more than 200 publications about, you know, um, RCT and visual analytics and visual quality metrics and so on. Uh, so basically, I give the floor to, to Giuseppe. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to talk about another kind of risk, uh, not, not the chemical, not, not the COVID, but it's about cybersecurity. It is my, my field of expertise somehow. Let's discuss uh, a little bit of the context. Today, we have a thousand of vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities that are well known, documented, and publicly available. They are stored in some uh, American website, and they are known both to the defenders and the attackers. You have all the details of them. Hmm? what they do, how to exploit them, and so on. And you can take one vulnerability, you can exploit the computer to go inside. But typically, the attack is not just one step, it's a multi-step. My target is here, I go for this path, to reach this computer. And um, the attack graph is just the union of all the stuff, all the possible attack all the weakness we have. And we can, uh, this is the entrance of the attacker, this is the real target. You, you have some details about them, but we don't care, of course. But everyone knows about them. This is a typical attack, multi-path. We have a, a path from the attacker to the target. And we have the union of them. That is the list of all possible path an attacker can follow. And we have uh, some countermeasure turn off a computer, cause an epic port, and so on. This is the state of the art in cybersecurity. And it is a very simple idea, if we neglect the details. If we have uh, some uh, weakness, it's very likely that the attackers will use them. And uh, we analyze the weakness to reduce uh, uh, the, the problem, to be ready to defend ourselves. And we have an historical example of that. Hmm? The entry door of a castle was a big weakness. But my title was about the user. Hmm? Why I'm talking about software? What is the story of the user in it? The user now is living in a very complex world. It's not isolated. You have antivirus, software updates, backup, cryptography, devices, firewall, and so on. And he, he, had, he has to deal with this. And uh, let's go with the discussion about uh, why, what, and how, why people attack computer. What is the reason for that? So the idea is that we have a, a list of weakness. And uh, using that, that weakness, we can uh, forecast where the attacker will come in, hmm? like an old castle. And now we move it to the user. The story is, was about software. What about the user? They live in a complex world. And now I was explaining why people is attacking computer. A very old reason was for fun, but now it's not the case anymore. Basically, they do that for money. Hmm? They're selling data. Also, your password is important for them. They're do, doing scams, ransoms. Or they want to damage something, technically speaking, or damage the reputation or there is also ethical hacking. They do that for testing. It's called a penetration testing before done by good people. This is basically why. What? What is the target of the attack? The formalization now is called the CIA, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. And it's about the fact that uh, an attacker is looking to, for your data, is looking for your password, confidentiality, you take some data, credit card, emails, uh, and, and so on. And typical countermeasures for that are encryption, authentication, 
What about integrity? The attacker wants to change the data, hmm? changing data in bank, uh, public size, uh, and so on. Typical contributions are the permission, the control of the access. And the last but not least, the user will want to stop your work, want to obscure a website, you want to raise or encrypt data, you're not able to read that data anymore, blocking services, and so on. Redundancy is a good uh, answer for that, the way to finding this, this, this story. How, and this is the main point of, of, of my talk today, how the attacker exploit the user, user collaboration? What is the simplest way to get the information? Just listen. All the data that travels on the internet, when it's weakly encrypted, is easy to read. And the attacker just listening can get your email, files on your computer, social activity, getting your information on Facebook, message on the phone, and you can leak password, credit card, phone, and so on. The, the amount of information stored in this way is incredible. And um, you should always assume that the information we send around the, the internet or that we have on the computer is public. Not being paranoid, but uh, avoid to send password or credit card via email. Don't have, please, a, a file called the password.txt on your mobile. Hmm? And don't share password with your colleagues, friends. Take care that the public Wi-Fi hotspot in airport, cafe, are really dangerous, encryption is poor. Or asking, looking to the movies, you see very young people that very quickly discover a password, and generating minimum password in one second, they discover the solution. It is not true. It does not, it's not work in that way. Discovering a good password is not trivial. So the idea is that the attacker asks for it. In which way? Impersonating someone. You get a phone call or an email from someone that pretends to be a security officer or your organization or handing your credit card. And you know he knows your name. And he, he wants to control you and ask some something, personal data. And in the end, they will ask system credentials. The amount of success this strategy has is incredible. And uh, it's possible to impersonate a website. Internet is full of fake website that looks like the original one. You go in a fake <laughs> website, you enter your login and password, the attacker sees them and use them to open the real page. You go ahead without uh, noticing anything, but now your password, the username are in the hand of the attacker. This is called the phishing. Just asking in a different way, but they are asking for something from you. And they are, it'll go for animation or for this slide. We have uh, some example of phishing. Websites that seems correct and ask you for something. And they get your credential. You, I think you are aware of that, but they, the, the main point, I stop sharing, I stop the, okay. Can you see my slide running now? Yes. Okay. The point is that the quality of phishing is increasing. The old one was very low quality, grammar error, very big promise. Now things are changing. There is high quality of the signature, the logo, the address, the layout. The text is good. No errors inside, and the message is credible. Little benefit, not billions of euros, 50 euros, 80 euros. And the message asks for help or are offering a little award. The web pages that are generated are very close to the original one. It's not easy to dis distinguish. And now there is a technique that is called the social engineering, spare piercing, in which uh, using uh, Facebook, 
the attacker uses your name, your profession. You get a mail from a, a friend of yours or from a colleague. This is an attack. A messenger referring to a real problem that you likely have, a slow computer. Anyone has a slow computer. And uh, let assume that any request for credential or sensitive data on the web is phishing because there is no security activity that requires to contact individual user and request their credential. It makes no sense. And have a look for the site. If the start of the address is HTTPS, it is secure. If the S is missing, you're going spreading your data on public internet. If you are just in doubt, do nothing. Or the, the attacker can use your credential. How? Oh, or getting in the way that I discussed, discussed it before with phishing, or they can discover it. There are say, several techniques. They can look for a dictionary. If you use a password that makes sense, city, uh, man, or, or whatever. Or if you're using a very common password, they can take an attack that is not as a brute force. They take, uh, you, 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 you can, they share, they look for the, what people does do very commonly. Or they go for a combination, like the movies. This is effective only against short password. And the point is uh, how to select your password. This is to pitch us are for fun, but the reality is even worse. Here we have a list of the 25 top 10 passwords in 2018. The first one is one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not joking. Most of people use this password and so on. So it's very easy to discover a password in this list. And uh, what you have to avoid is to not use your name, your birthday and so on. I'm short of time, I know. And, and, and um, because people know about them looking for from the, the social. Yeah, there is a, a nice website. You can test your password there. And you can see if your password is already around or not. The brute force can go for billions of attempts per second. And you, your defense is, is only about with the length of the password. And uh, here there is a very quick comparison. If you go using normal characters, you need 13 to be sure. This is the time needed for discovering it. If you use a special character, you are secure with 12 characters for two centuries. Everything less than 12 is risky if you are serious about password. And there is a, a change in the trend. You can visit this web, website to, to test your, the, the strength of your password. This is the old approach using a very cryptic password, very hard to remember. This is a, a new trend. You can use a longer sentence. I love this password. This, this day I am tired. They are really hard to discover. Hundreds of thousands of centuries. You can test this, that here. Or they can run a malicious code on your machine. I'll give you just a, an example. You have an email attachment that uh, initially is data.txt.x. It is inacceptable. But Microsoft eyes the extension. So this name becomes this. You look to this data.txt. Oh, fine. I open it and you run a malicious code. Or you have site simulating a good one. And going on that side, download some software. You have some alias, antivirus, backups, firewall, software update. Take care of them. Take care of them. Don't forget them. And stop at picking the attack. This is the conclusion. If you don't say nothing, the attacker cannot listen what you don't say. 
If you don't type your password on your fixed site, you, you cannot read it. If you use a good password, it will take hundreds of years to discover it. If you don't link, don't touch a link, a malicious link, the, the attacker cannot run a program on your machine. And please update your software. The famous WannaCry was killing computers months after the release of the patch. People was not updating the software. And here there is a, my last slide, uh, the sense of uh, the combination. I discussed the, the attack graph in, in an initial part of my talk, talking about software vulnerabilities. But now the researchers try to combine the software vulnerabilities with the human vulnerabilities. And the idea is to formalize the user weakness. People that uh, does not uh, log out. People that use password in a not good way, weak password, and, and so on. They post it with the password on the computer. And we can include this weakness inside the computation data graph. It's possible to exploit this machine because Bob uses weak password. And uh, we can design countermeasure for that. And the countermeasure for uh, human vulnerabilities are sensitization and training the user, like some of the slides that I show you, too fast, but now you know a little bit more. Uh, controlling the password, having some internal control of the user to password or, or in, in your um, company. You can go for doing penetration tests against the user. This is really funny to me. Jigsaw that is connected to Google created a test to check how much people is uh, sensible to phishing. The first question was asking to enter name and email. And most people do that. So this is the future of the story. And uh, I conclude my talk. Sorry for the technical in inconvenience. And you're ready to get questions if you have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, Giuseppe, we should move forward because you, you take a little bit yeah. longer time than maybe at the end, uh, if there are questions at the end, we will... Uh, okay, fine. A very, very interesting uh, presentation. So stop, uh, I stop. Okay. sharing of your screen. Yes, and yes. Now we move to the next speakers. And then uh, we'll speak Martina Jacob. That is, um, Martina is um, currently a senior researcher of Leibniz Institute in Bordeaux, Germany, for agricultural engineering and bioeconomy. She works in the field of agricultural engineering with specification in ergonomics and health and safety. Properly. Um, for today, I have chosen just one small bit, which will be part of the report. It's going to be quite a comprehensive report, and Anik has already described the structure. And uh, one of um, the parts was to describe um, the trends and changes but uh, also the future challenges for occupational safety and health in agriculture and also for forestry. Now, we have identified several trends and I've listed some of them uh, here on the slide. One of the major trends in agriculture and industry in general is uh, smart technology, smart farming, precision farming, digitalization, automization, using of robots and other technological developments. Another very important issue for agriculture uh, during the day is climate change and uh, resulting environmental issues. But uh, society on consumer trends also have a great impact on agricultural and forestry production and uh, development on the labor market and resulting organizational issues are uh, having an impact. And finally, international trade and economic considerations. Now those which are in italic, I will uh, sketch uh, in the next few minutes. Um, smart farming uh, developments have a great potential to reduce occupational safety and health risks and improve the working environment. One thing is that um, with automation, labor is replaced by capital, and in consequence, we will have less accidents and also less illnesses. 
but uh, smart technologies also allow improved process control and uh, a better safety systems management. Another thing is that uh, we are expecting uh, with uh, use of smart technologies that uh, the exposure of da uh, to dangerous substances is reduced because we could use uh, automatic vehicles. We can also use automatic weeding and uh, reduce uh, the number of substances used. Or maybe one day we use drones to spray uh, the, the substances and people do not touch them. Um, then we also expect uh, that the work-life balance of the farmers will improve because of more flexibility when they use uh, smart technology. One example would be milking robots. They have uh, relieved uh, the farmers from the burden of getting up early. And um, we also expect that uh, smart monitoring technologies could be used for um, uh, looking at health and safety of the workers and not only looking at animal health or welfare. And regarding forestry, it has already been proven that uh, the use of full harvesters is drastically reducing uh, the risk of injury. But uh, when we use new technologies, we also have to keep in mind that they need to be evaluated. We need new safety protocols. And uh, with using bigger machines, we have uh, more loan work. Um, when we use artificial intelligence, uh, we have to consider the ethics behind it because machines are uh, making decisions. And uh, we've just heard about data security. Farmers have more and more uh, or rely more and more on data exchange and they have IT software uh, and, and um, hardware so they can be hacked and uh, experience other interferences. And of course, we need to adapt the education to make the best use of these smart technologies. Now, a very uh, large impact on uh, agricultural and forestry production is of course uh, caused by climate change. On the one hand, farmers are uh, producing a lot of greenhouse gases, but on the other hand, um, they really suffer from uh, all these uh, events uh, due to climate change. Extreme weather events have drastically increased the danger of accidents in the last years. And uh, this, of course, causes stress for the farmers and also financial pressure because uh, these weather events are usually coupled with financial losses. Another issue is that um, we are experiencing longer or hotter summers and um, med uh, medical doctors are uh, more often seeing skin cancer symptoms and um, it could be that uh, people change their working patterns during, uh, to shift to night work because it's so hot during the day and we have to look at uh, the prevention of dehydration of workers that work outside. Another issue is that um, insect-borne diseases and pests are spreading, uh, well, uh, with warmer and milder winters, they're going north in Europe. So we have more people that are affected by them. And uh, the dry conditions also uh, cause dry grounds and um, therefore the risk of inhaling dust could increase. And finally, um, all these uh, events and, and side effects cause uh, a lot of distress for farmers, financial losses and other related problems like farmer bashing. Now, um, I would like to raise uh, your interest to forests as well, because uh, forests are also uh, very much uh, affected by extreme weather events, uh, especially forest fires have uh, become more frequent, but also storms or floods have increased the number of accidents in the last year in the forest because of uh, the clearing um, work after 
after these events. Dry conditions in forests also um, uh, make unpredictable uh, things happen, like falling branches. Some trees drop branches when they get uh, too dry, and uh, trunks can break without um, uh, knowing before. And this also causes mental health effects like distress, financial problems, and other issues. Now, another uh, very important uh, trend is that consumers and also societies are raising their demands uh, on food production. And this means, again, for the farmers that they have more stress, but they also find their occupation more and more less rewarding because um, they are blamed for certain actions like industrial farming is uh, a word which is often used by consumers and it's uh, uh, with a negative touch. But also um, the demands increase the complexity of tasks uh, for the farmers and they have more bureaucracy. But uh, the societal trends are quite hard to predict. Uh, it could also happen that uh, organic farming increases. And organic farming, you will know, is more labor intensive. So it's coupled with more manual work. And it's harder to automate because of the complexity and uh, also because of uh, the small scale. And uh, finally, uh, the society, uh, or we're watching uh, within society an increased activism against farmers and also foresters. And this really causes psychosocial stress. And th the last point is um, the impact of labor market trends on occupational safety and health. Um, we are watching that farmers become more and more pluriactive um, because uh, it's hard to make a living out of only one thing on the farm. And uh, this pluriactivity uh, has been proven to increase the danger of accidents because the farmers are working longer hours and it also causes stress because you have to manage many different things. Another very important issue is that um, we do not exactly know the extent of accidents and illnesses because Self-employed farmers are not included in the accident statistics, uh, not necessarily. Some countries do, but some countries don't. It's not obligatory. And they're also not always included in insurance schemes in their countries. And uh, the EU framework directive does not cover the self-employed. It's not necessary for them to carry out risk assessment. And um, the last thing is that um, we do see that uh, the age of farmers is, it has been increasing. And a lot of retirees and farmers above 60 years of age are still working on the farm. And they are statistically more likely to have accidents and also health problems. And they usually receive less training opportunities. So I would like to conclude. Um, the report is going to be finalized in the last uh, quarter of this year. Um, we would like to conclude that farming and forestry remain one of the most dangerous sectors, which need to be watched uh, carefully. And underreporting of accident is a major problem. And um, the impact of smart technologies is expected diverse. We do not know what exactly or how large the impact will be. Uh, we've been watching a very low uptake in agriculture, and we are expecting a digital divide also within one country, but also in between Europe. So it's quite a complicated uh, process to make predictions. And uh, we would like to stress that a stronger focus should be put on the self-employed to include them in our strategy. OK, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Martina. We go to, we are at short of time. So we go to the next speaker. That is going to be a professor, Madalena Gioia Gibelli. And, uh, she is a landscape architect. 
and these activities are associated to landscape studies. Uh, so basically, we'll, we'll give you the floor. She speak about do landscape act on lifestyle, resources, perception, and choices. It will be a short presentation, then after it, it will be a discussion. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me, and uh, I'm proud to be with you. And uh, I will talk with you about something very different uh, from uh, the previous um, uh, the previous uh, talks. I hope that uh, it uh, could uh, uh, meet your interest uh, because I, I will uh, talk to you about landscape. Uh, rural and agricultural landscape, uh, most of all, of course, and uh, mm, something that uh, can match uh, your interests about uh, health and safety, I hope, uh, because I think that uh, we can talk about uh, safety and health for uh, some uh, uh, little things from uh, for uh, soil or soil products of agriculture. Mm -hmm. If you don't uh, have a, a, a healthy uh, landscape and uh, a, a safety landscape, so I will try to speak to you about this kind of uh, topics. And uh, in this uh, healthy, in this health of landscape, uh, the humans play a, a very, very huge role with uh, their choices and decisions, and uh, that's why I have this title. Uh, so, uh, because uh, uh, the lifestyles, the perception, uh, and uh, uh, the resources, and the needed resources, play a big, a big role mm -hmm. in order to change landscape that can change uh, in a, a through a, a healthy condition, but also through a non-healthy condition. Uh, so, um, uh, I consider landscape not just uh, an aesthetic or cultural items, but uh, a multifunctional system, uh, really a, 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 a complex system uh, in which uh, cultural, economical and environmental functions are linked very strictly and make, uh, and make the change on... Uh, sorry, I... I have to move it, okay? And uh, can change a lot, uh, depending from the society and from the values that society can recognize along its history and evolution. And this is, uh, to me, a very important item, because a very important issue, because uh, the values that we as a society attribute to nature, to landscape, to agriculture, are, uh, so are critical for their uh, conservation. Uh, so, uh, it's uh, interesting uh, to uh, see for a while to the um, dynamics uh, that uh, drive uh, the landscape development. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, uh, as uh, uh, everybody knows, they are driven by climate. And we have uh, talked about climate in this time. Uh, it is changing, so probably also, uh, and surely, uh, landscape will change uh, just for climate change. But uh, we are, at the same time, the driving force of climate change, so they are very, very intersected. And uh, hydromorphology and uh, uh, the conditioning of climate and hydromorphology make the evolution of uh, the ecosystem components and then the ecosystems as uh, uh, complex uh, systems. And... Uh, um, then we have uh, the animals and the humans, uh, and here we are. Uh, the humans uh, and also animals, everybody, every, uh, every creature in the world, uh, use the local resources uh, in, the, uh, in the way that uh, their needs ask for. And this is a, an important uh, uh, point. Uh, because uh, in the ancient uh, uh, landscape till the uh, Industrial Revolution, most of all, uh, the needs were very, very basic uh, and uh, they were just food, fi uh, food um, pr um, produce food or recovery food and live. And uh, a, w one man went uh, when uh, we were meeting uh, a new place. Uh, uh, watching a tit, and uh, as uh, uh, in uh, the for the perception, its perception that is done 
of uh, its knowledge, experiences, uh, and uh, uh, desire, uh, could decide how to change that piece of world uh, in order to produce uh, what he was needing uh, in that moment, or it, uh, that its a family, his family, were needed in uh, that uh, uh, in that moment. And uh, with uh, this kind of change, uh, the actual uh, uh, rural and uh, agricultural landscape uh, was uh, uh, were built. It and uh, the perception and the choices, the perception of resources and the choices uh, that. Uh, are linked to, to these kind of perceptions uh, are uh, critical in order to change. And uh, uh, this now, but uh, to, today, what, what happened today? Today, uh, we have the 70% of population, uh, European population that lives in urban area, the 50% 50, 50 that, uh, of the world population that lives uh, in urban areas. And uh, they have an urban culture and uh, urban lifestyles and urban needs. So the resources uh, are not the same for them, uh, are not the same, the same of the ones of the previous century, because yes, water is always important because it's the base of, uh, of uh, life. But now water is uh, the one that comes out from a tap or the water of a pool or something like that. And soil, what is soil? Is asphalt, is a road. And uh, the needs of food and liver are something that is very complicated now, not just the uh, weight or corn or something like that. Like that. It's uh, very, very complicated. Also houses are uh, uh, very, very complicated. And so what uh, is, what are now the driver forces uh, of this landscape? Uh, energy, information, exchange of information, perception, again, because uh, we uh, again use the perception as the first kind of knowledge when we meet uh, a new, uh, a new landscape, a new world, a new New something new, and the choices, and uh, the uh, our landscape, actual landscape, uh, produce uh, other new landscape uh, as uh, the bottom ones, the highway landscape, the new agricultural landscape that are geometric and very very um, uh, straight, and also art. In the middle, you see a, a picture that is uh, a contemporary artist that was. Painting Anthropocene, copying uh, the uh, the uh, plants of uh, uh, the town. Why I am telling uh, everything uh, of this kind? Because uh, everything uh, is very very linked to uh, the energy consumption and uh, the perception. So uh, have a look to these uh, numbers. They are uh, a little bit uh, interesting because. Uh, um, they can remember you how squanderer we are. Uh, here you see the consumption of energy and uh, the production of waste increasing in, uh, in uh, the centuries. Now we have a, a very huge production, as you every, every know, uh, everyone knows, but this production of energy and the production of waste uh, bring this kind of effects uh, on water, on air, and uh, takes uh, a lot of uh, a, a new increase of energy needs. So we are, we are in uh, something that can uh, be um, described as an endless process. Human change landscape, the new lifestyles create new urban landscapes for, for lazy people, I mean, and uh, the lazy people change landscape in a more, in a more artificial way. And, and uh, we, are, um, uh, we are exporting artificialization outside uh, the towns. Uh, Zernave, that is a, a landscape ecology, Israeli landscape ecology, 99, um, uh, said that, that uh, today, in 99, so uh, in uh, 20 years, 30 years ago, uh, the world was a total human ecosystem, uh, intending that uh, uh, in, uh, already in 99, uh, women, uh, uh, sorry, women 
um, drive uh, the uh, processes, uh, the main processes uh, in the world and uh, the global change uh, and so on. So now we go uh, at, the, uh, at the more detailed scale and we look uh, at uh, the agricultural landscape uh, uh, from a closer point of view and we can see what happens uh, in, the, in the landscape when it, it changes. So in this, uh, in this image uh, you see a situation that uh, shows a, a, a good complexity, uh, complexity in ecosystems, in, in agroecosystem that that has a good complexity uh, that is done uh, by multifunctionality, heterogeneity, that is the landscape diversity, resilience, uh, resilience because uh, this kind, this top, these elements, these items uh, can uh, have some synergies between uh, each other, can uh, have a relation, can exchange information ex ex um, each other, and this uh, is uh, a good uh, um, action, a good function for uh, improved resilience. And there is probably a, a good biodiversity. And uh, all these uh, uh, functions and uh, uh, patterns uh, make uh, benefits to, to, to the man in terms of uh, um, reduced soil erosion uh, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, terms of uh, uh, mitigate the local climate, water purification, permit the water purification, they are beauty. And uh, there is a, a low uh, degree of vulnerability of the whole system, just because uh, the, these uh, uh, elements uh, play uh, uh, as a system. And so when a disturbance uh, comes there, probably there is something, they have a lot of strategies to respond, to answer to the disturbance. And this is the, be the beauty of this kind of landscape. When it changes in this way with uh, the um, industrial agriculture, what happens? It happens uh, that uh, we have uh, a banalization of ecosystems, less relationships uh, between items because we don't have any more items. So uh, what kind of relationships we can have? Landscape diversity and biodiversity are, are, are lost, uh, connectivity, resilience and so on. And we have monofunctionality, specialization, more energy, more water required, as fertilizer, and so on. And we have high vulnerability. So um, all these transformations created a very dissipative system and uh, uh, increase uh, the vulnerability of the ecosystems, of the agroecosystems. But uh, we have. Uh, another kind of vulnerability that uh, plays at an upper scale, the scale of um, a, a, large, a larger scale. Uh, these are two uh, pictures uh, um, of uh, an agricultural landscape in the, in the right, on the right, and uh, a periurban agricultural landscape in the, on the left. And I say that the left one is more vulner vulnerable and uh, the right is less vulnerable. Why? Uh, not just only because uh, ecosystems uh, are banalized, but also because uh, the uh, left one is uh, threatened by urbanization. And uh, uh, the, uh, we can find uh, or recognize that uh, some, uh, the most significant uh, vari variable uh, that uh, are linked uh, with the vulnerability of this, with this kind of vulnerability, that is uh, uh, the uh, probably probabilities that uh, uh, a certain landscape unit can change uh, in a significant manner or can disappear uh, just for uh, the exchange coming from uh, from the external from uh, sorry just for the disturbances that come from uh, the external as uh, urbanization and uh, these variables are landscape the extensions and shape of landscape unit the type of borders that can be uh, 
uh, borders uh, with disturbances, uh, as in this case, or not, uh, presence uh, or of conflicting elements. Here, you find uh, a lot of different uh, elements that uh, uh, doesn't care of agriculture, it doesn't uh, um, play with uh, agriculture, and uh, the internal fragmentation and the intensity of use of the soil. And uh, uh, so these uh, variables can be uh, the vulnerability indicators. So we can have a set of vulnerability indicators in order to measure the, um, the weakness of uh, uh, the landscapes, the, uh, the degree of disturbances, and this degree of disturbances is, is linked with the health of uh, uh, the landscape and of the production that uh, in that kind of uh, land you can have because uh, the dis disturbances um, that are roads, uh, so pollution of roads, but also uh, some uh, other activity come, coming from uh, the urbanization can um, act in, uh, in, a, in a bad way on the production. And uh, if uh, the uh, landscape units uh, are uh, smaller, they are much more uh, disturb, dist uh, disturbed. So we can measure, measure uh, this kind of vulnerability. You, uh, we had uh, a research in uh, here, in, close to my, my city, that is Milano, in order to uh, understand the, um, the limit of, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, of uh, the um, uh, land area that uh, uh, at, a, at, a certain, at a certain point uh, are uh, very, very tightened by urbanization and can change very, very fast. And this uh, is uh, a, a, a graph that uh, tell you that uh, after that for uh, tesseras that are smaller than two hectares, we have a, 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 an exponential probability to disappear. So we can say that landscape can be consumed as well as its ecosystem services, but uh, ecosystem services are that kind of benefits that uh, the different functionality of uh, um, uh, rural and agricultural landscape can give to humans and they have a values, have, they have uh, economical values. Uh, we can get them uh, for free, but they have economical values because they do what uh, we have to do in other uh, way, paying them. I mean, the purifi purifying of water, if uh, we do it, uh, uh, we have to pay for purifying water, but uh, ecosystems, uh, ecosystem can purify water in a good way. Uh, okay, I go fast because it's very late, but uh, we have uh, other uh, ethos that uh, we, we, uh, we use in order to uh, assess the vulnerability of the, um, for example, after a uh, huge transformation coming from uh, uh, the construction of uh, highway of road that uh, are a big uh, driver of uh, landscape transformation and big driver of pollution, uh, of disturbances uh, and uh, on uh, the agricultural land. And, uh, uh, and we go to ecosystem services that uh, I think that uh, everybody knows them. They are uh, uh, divided in uh, four uh, families, uh, the supporting uh, services that are uh, linking the most of all with the habitat uh, and biodiversity, regulating that are the services that are good in order to mitigate climate, climate to purify um, uh, water and so on, to also uh, mitigate the hydrological uh, uh, risk and uh, also regulating uh, the health uh, today, we, we can say the health risks and the provi provisioning that are the, the services to uh, product, product uh, food uh, and fibers, and the co most, most of all, cultural services, because cultural services are the ones that uh, make uh, the consciousness uh, of the problems uh, and can give the, the tools for the good decisions to the, uh, uh, to the citizens that uh, are uh, in the urban areas and have to make choices also for nature and for agriculture. 
Uh, we can map uh, ecosystem services in the full family and making, mapping them, we can uh, highlight the potentiality and the criticalities of uh, a, a landscape unit. In this case, we did that, uh, we did that for a landscape unit of uh, 600 hectares um, in the south of Milano, uh, inside the municipality of Milano. Uh, this was uh, an area that uh, was, um, uh, it was uh, um, uh, decided uh, to transform it uh, in another piece of city and uh, it uh, should have uh, a, a big road, a big highway that uh, had to cross it in the middle from north to south and uh, using this kind of um, tools uh, in a participation, in a participated uh, process with population and farmers, uh, we can see that we saved this, part, this area that up to now, up to now is an agricultural, an agricultural park producing rice and produces, uh, producing culture and producing services for the city, a lot of services. I go fast to the conclusion. Uh, we can say that either environmental, cultural and economical functions are influenced by spatial configurations and heterogeneity, the intensity degree of land uses, disturbances of rural ensemble, in addition to the native resources and the history of the places. Everything of this make uh, 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 influenced uh, uh, also the, the social economic uh, um, system and uh, beside uh, the social economic system uh, influenced the landscape. And uh, my conclusion now is uh, that uh, the landscape paradigm open to a new approach to safety and health. Uh, COVID-19 gave an acceleration uh, the relationships between habitat lost and habitat degraded, the loss of biodiversity and uh, the diffusion of pandemic something to deal with. Uh, we, know, we now know that uh, uh, probably uh, coronavirus came from the forests of China and uh, found some uh, need some uh, uh, mean to pass to a human uh, in the market, in China's market. This, this is one of the theory, the, one of the most popular theory and it is uh, realistic. And uh, uh, the um, habitat lost uh, is a, a, a big, a huge fac facilitation of this uh, process uh, that could repeat tomorrow with uh, another bacteria or another virus. Then agriculture and food production are a part of the discussion, absolutely. Intensive agriculture and its effects on biodiversity are well known. And they are a problem uh, for the sixth extinction and it is uh, uh, the, probably the main problem that this century has to, uh, to deal with. Uh, uh, it's uh, very, very close uh, to the problems of uh, global uh, of the climate change, and they are absolutely uh, intersected. So, uh, the conservation of biodiversity, also in the landscape, uh, in the agricultural landscape, uh, is uh, a, 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 a very important uh, topic. Then livestock conditions and their possible role to diffuse the zootic pandemic are not as well. Uh, in, uh, in these days uh, in Italy, we are discussing a lot uh, about uh, the, introduced, uh, the role of uh, introducing the hunting species because uh, uh, it seems that they uh, play a, that, can, that uh, they can play a, an important role in this uh, because they are sick, they uh, spread uh, all over the, sick, the sickness. Uh, in uh, 2016, Wilson, that is uh, one of the main ecologists, uh, he called for setting aside 50% on the earth surfaces for other species as the only possible strategy to solve the, the extinction crisis. So I thought that if not possible anyway, we have to change our monothematic approach 
and go fast to a systemic one able to manage the complexity of our planet. The uh, new strategy on biodiversity of the Europe, uh, European Union ask us to have the, the, to reach the uh, 30% in 2013, uh, including uh, uh, rural landscape and agro-ecosystems. Then i sorry for the, to be uh, too long. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now I think um, there is actually no time for, uh, for questions because we were very late. And uh, I think uh, if you agree as a last presenter to share your email, your presentation with your email on the website of the conference, I think everybody agree on this. Maybe Martin and Nick, if you agree, we, we post your presentation on the website with the email. So you can, people can ask you a question on this, uh, on this, uh, on what you presented today. I think uh, today we had, um, you know, very nice uh, speaking, you know, about, uh, we have a very nice uh, picture of what's happening in the US and how, you know, regulation or no regulation could play an important role, not only in agriculture, but in life of uh, citizen. And, um, and then we have, we have a nice idea about, you know, how different looks like, you know, agriculture in uh, Nordic countries and, you know, with some more, you know, normative, uh, you know, uh, grip on it. And um, and then and then we have a nice uh, also presentation about chemical risk assessment in agriculture and norms, uh, you know, and all these activities that actually is important uh, for, for train to, to be exploited with training with farmer. And then we also see, you know, um, something related, you know, important step that you take with OSHA agency to basically, you know, um, tell people how to, you know, how to improve safety and health issues. And we have also a useful guide in cybersecurity that, you know, everybody of us was sometimes affected a little or more on this topic that was quite, um, you know, explain it in the, in the presentation. And at the end we learned that maybe landscape uh, can also play a role in this pandemic, but this is an aspect that actually we need the further investigation on it, because of course, you know, we also need to experience different uh, level of infection in industrialized area compared to, you know, more agricultural or touristic areas. And this is something that has a role and uh, for sure to protect maybe the environment to protect, you know, people, you know, but of course it's a, it's a very large uh, topic to me. So um, I think um, everybody here, and okay, again, the presentation will be on the website. And uh, so now I, I give the floor to uh, Giampaolo Schilacci, that is the organizer of the next event. Uh, hopefully it will be a face-to-face -face event. Thanks, Remigio. Uh, thanks to the audience. Thanks to the speakers. On behalf of the organizing committee, I tell you that we are very happy to have stayed in contact with the SHWA people. And thanks to, to this, uh, towards Saragusa 2021 online event. I hope that for the audience, this online event has been successful and fruitful too. And this benefit is connected with uh, the quality of the speakers and of their presentation. I think that new research stimuli have emerged, new themes that can be developed in Ragusa Shva 2021. I think the link between Nordic Conference and the Ragusa SHWA proposed by Peter could be very fruitful. So I urge all of us to prepare uh, the participation in the conference to be held in, uh, in, uh, in Norway. Right, Peter? The, the next is in Norway, September. The whole organizing committee thanks the speakers and the participants. We invite you to stay in touch and visit the website 
of Ragusa SHWA for the new deadlines for the presentation of the submission of the abstracts concerning the sixth Ragusa SHWA edition that will be held in Ragusa, Italy, starting from 15th of next September. We wish you an excellent closing of summer 2020. So I think at this point we can close the... Everybody that is still here, please, you know, maybe activate your camera so we can make a picture of uh, the survivor, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Remigio. Grazie, Remigio. Thank you all of you eh, for uh, for uh, for participating here. Okay. It has been a very good conference. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. I make one more shot of the cameras here. This is like to see who is still here, or like a student, you know, left only the user there, but is not there, you know. So, so the people that are not here in the last picture, they will not get a discount for the conference. <laughs> no? Okay, no, kidding. Okay, but thank you very much, everybody, for participating. To to not uh, losing, you know, the gap. To not losing the the trade from you know past uh, Ragusa Shva conference to the next one. So I wish you all of you to see all of you at the next conference organized in beautiful Ragusa. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to inform you that the fifth edition of the International Conference Ragusa SHWA will be held in September 2020. The conference deal with the topics connected with safety, health and welfare in agriculture and agro-systems. Rigasuabla is the venue of the conference. Case of wonderful Baroque architecture Rigasuabla is sited in the southern Sicily, the greatest island of the Mediterranean Sea. Rigasa SHWA started from 2008 and all the editions were held under the auspices of Italian Republic President. In the occurrence of Expo 2015, the fourth edition was held in the lovely town of Lodi, close to Milan, together with the International Congress on Rural Health. The two international conferences adopted the Lodi Declaration on Rural Health. Rigasa SHWE is a conference which allow for close interaction with attendees. English is the official language. As concerns topics, since 2012 the presentations about WMSDs and urban safety are dramatically increased. As concerns the previous editions, SHWA provided each participant the book of abstracts and a CD containing all the papers presented. The papers were also published in the conference website. Please, follow Rigasa SHWA on website www.rigasashwa.it, on Facebook and Twitter and let us have your any suggestion to innovate SHWA and make it more attractive for you. Remember that in September the weather in Sicily is not hot and the sea is still splendid. All we'll be very happy to invite you to cut with us the final cake of the 5th edition of the International Conference Rigasa SHWA 2020.